נשים. May I have your attention, please? I'd like to welcome you to our session this afternoon. Our session is a very important session. It has to do with sources of Arab discrimination in this country. Before we start, I'd like to make the commercial first. And the first commercial is the University of UCLA is going to have a, a party for Sabah Fakhri on the 9th of May. So anybody who is in the, near the campus of UCLA will check with the, with the university. And the second commercial is about the Feminist Arab American Network. They are going to have a registration in the Alexa, Alexandria Suite on the second floor at 6 p.m. Anyone interested, please contact Linda. Uh, she will be there to register. Many of you are aware of discrimination, but many are not really aware of the sources of the Arab discrimination in this country. There are so many, and the major, the ma the major uh, source of Arab discrimination sometimes is our apathy. So it is, if we allow others to do discrimination against us, we are really an accessory to discrimination. And this is why ADC is here to help you not to be a victim of discrimination and not to be an accessory of discrimination. We have this afternoon a very distinguished panel. We, we are going to start with Dr. Jack Shaheen. Jack Shaheen is a professor of mass communication at Southern Illinois University. He is an expert on stereotyping Arabs and Muslims in mass media. Shaheen is a frequent guest on major radio and television programs and has written more than 300 articles. He wrote and spoke extensively on the dehumanization of Arabs during the Gulf crisis and war. He was a Fulbright Hayes lecturer at the University of Jordan and the American University of Beirut. Selected by the US Department of State as a scholar diplomat, he offered seminars for government officials and journalists in the Middle East for the United States Information Agency. He is the author of Nuclear War Films and the TV Arab, and his work in progress include the Hollywood, the Hollywood Arab and the comic book Arab. Jack Shaheen is one of my heroes. When he visited me in Colorado two years ago, he made me go around and spend sleepless nights watching late, late films and look for comics and for other things to try to cut them and do something about them. So if any of you want, some, want sleepless nights, please listen carefully to Jack Shaheen because he is a resource that really gives you confidence and gives you education and inspiration. Jack. <laughs> That's probably the nicest introduction anyone could ask for. Thank you, Hamsi. It's a pleasure to be with friends, to be with friends, to share a blueprint for action. A blueprint for action, if we recall, especially what was said yesterday by the Pulitzer Prize winning author Seymour Hirsch, who wrote The Samson Option, and who prior to writing The Samson Option was used to being praised and honored and receiving tremendous numbers of lectures, but yet when he writes the Samson option, there's an induced silence, as if what he revealed 
was a taboo. And Hirsch looked out among us and he said, I know how you must feel. It's an invisible issue, he said, that anyone who notices a taboo, and in our case the taboo being the Arab image, becomes a taboo himself or herself. Our feelings and knowledge of peoples are determined historically by three things. What we learn in our homes, the church, the synagogue, the mosque, and finally from school and our peers. But in the past few decades, there's been a fourth factor, a fourth learning center, that is namely the media curriculum. Now these four learning centers teach us what to feel, what to think about other peoples, thus shaping and perpetuating the omnipresent Arab image. The origin of the word stereotype is really the printing press. One plate, as a result, many copies, but the copies have one thing in common, they're rigid and repetitive, no change, thus giving the impression of permanence. A stereotype of any group is not based on valid knowledge, it's inaccurate, it's acquired secondhand rather than through direct experience, and most important, it's resistant to change through a new experience. It acts as amoeba, assimilating phases of its own development. And for us, regardless of our heritage, addressing anti-Arab sources of discrimination is ultimately an issue of conscience and morality, because a day does not go by when an ugly Arab does not pop up. This afternoon, let me just share with you an overview of some of the sources that men and women use to denigrate Arabs, briefly. One, newspapers, tabloids. Anything from syndicated columnists, local columnists, comic strips from Doonesbury to Dennis the Menace, crossword puzzles, editorial boards, editorial cartoons, news services, local regional correspondents in the Mideast, film, TV, book critics, religious editors, advertisements, popular magazines, radio, newscasts, local, region, national, commercials, talk and music shows, local, regional, national, school textbooks at all levels, school magazines, reference works, anything from almanacs to thesauruses, greeting cards, children's books, children's toys, children's games, coloring books, children's magazines, billboards, bumper stickers, language cassettes. This is interesting. I came across the language cassette to learn Arabic because my Arabic on a scale of 1 to 10 is minus 100. And this is what it said. It said, when the sheik of Araby creeps into your tent at night, surprise him by starting up a conversation in his native tongue. That's to sell a language cassette to learn Arabic. Recordings. There are, since 1826 to the present, there are at least 175 titles that a colleague of mine has recorded. Novels, merchandise for sale, such as t-shirts, theatrical plays and musicals, the US government and all the agencies, particularly the immigration office, politicians, religious leaders and publications, computer video games, arcade games, computer systems at universities, academic journals and institutions, and the list goes on. Each one of these areas in and of itself is a book, a book which documents the injustice and calls for action. Now, for those of you who watch a great deal of television up to six hours a day, the average American family, six hours a day plus, and view motion pictures and read comic books. By the way, the average comic book reader is 21 years of age, uh, spends $10 a week on comic books. Uh, we find that, that in, in movie theaters, that this image not only appears in movie theaters, but on Vizio cassettes, on cable systems, in hotels, and in motels that when we look at comic books more than 250 covering a 50-year period that I alone have found, and I live in the thriving city of Edwardsville, Illinois, you know, population 10,000. And then we look to television and we see on television a wide range of sources. Children's cartoon shows, network prime time shows, syndicated programs, new movies of the week, old movies of the week, syndicated network talk shows, syndicated 
local morning shows and newscasts, documentaries, wrestling, Abdullo the Unculo to Palestina, commercials, sports shows, music videos, all of these different categories just within one medium of communication. So what do we do? And what is the state? How do we change all of this? Why do we, why do we have to each and every day face this, and why are others insensitive to this particular issue? Well, in tracking the TV Arab, I must say to you that after about eight years, the best way to attack any problem in our society, and I can't overemphasize this fact, is to make the injustice visible. No one can deny the evidence that we must gather this evidence and present the evidence in a compelling and telling fashion. And then and only then can we begin to expect a change in perceptions. This image exists for, never, for many reasons. I, I like to list the big I factor, and we can get into more details later. The I factor, ignorance, indolence, indifference, income, incomplete, what's excluded, what's left out of the cultural mainstream, Israeli government officials and those who support the Israeli government. But let us never stereotype the American Jewish community or Israelis because some of the most sympathetic supporters who have fought against this stereotype that I've met have been American Jews. You know, seeing the riots in Los Angeles reminded me of a Chinese American who was beaten to death with a baseball bat in Detroit several years ago because he was perceived as being a Jap. Not a Japanese American, but as a Jap. And the men who killed him with that baseball bat never served a day. Not a day. They were let scot-free. And I keep asking myself in a course that I teach called Images of the Other, why do we need villains? <laughs> why do we have to have someone to pick on, a scapegoat? Because in our society, for, for, for at least a century, particularly this, this the last hundred years, the Arab is America's boogeyman, or boogie person to be more liberal. He's outlasted other scapegoats, Asians, blacks, Hispanics, Jews, Italians. But like the Arab, they once appeared as inferior beings. History teaches us that in order to successfully dehumanize peoples, image makers only need to portray them as different. Different. Now the following is a blueprint of a boogie person that's an Arab, but you could replace Arab with almost any other word. Hmm? Any other word. For example, you clothe the scapegoat differently. With the Arab, it's bedsheets. Huh? He or she is made up of dark features, is unattractive, needs a shave, has bad breath. They speak with foreign accents. They pose as an economic threat, whether it's oil or terrorism or automobiles against civilized societies. Supposedly, this international menace worships a different deity, is anti-Christian, anti-Jew. He teaches his women as chattel, opting instead to rape and abduct white Western women. Inept in the bedroom and on the battlefield, this coward thrives on torturing innocents. Appearing as a faceless mask, he willingly dies for the cause. And such behavior to mass audiences seems natural. It seems natural because they do not value human life as much as we do. When combating this image, we have to consider the basic law of physics. I remember I earned a D minus in physics. The basic law of physics is water does not boil unless you apply heat. And in our case, I think a great deal of heat needs to be applied. We must have action with a focus, with a direction. Change will only occur when the injustice is made visible, when we begin to see the unjust portraits and begin to cancel them with humane images. Now, one, one modest suggestion is this. Suppose, for example, and this can be discussed and debated later, ADC chapters focused on specific sources of anti-Arab discrimination. I rattled off about 30, okay? school books, television programs, whatever. The monthly magazine could list what chapters focus on what anti-Arab sources. For example, when an AB ADC member reacts to a source 
of anti-Arab discrimination, he or she sends the chapter information about that source. In other words, if he's written a letter or made a phone call, whatever he or she has done, he shares that information with the chapter that has the authority to attack that specific problem. Now, the ADC chapter in charge of this category will then take appropriate action, such as have letters, uh, have meetings, whatever, but they will be in charge of taking appropriate action. This chapter will share with the national office here in Washington all information pertaining to the anti-Arab source. And then the DC office may take further action, as well as solicit national support by informing members in their monthly newsletter. Now this continuing coordinated effort called networking is one way to achieve a focus, one way to categorize and define anti-Arab sources of discrimination, which will, I think, help bring about needed scholarship to reveal the injustice. I like to think of a proverb taught to me by my neighbor, Mr. Hunedi. He says it beautifully in Arabic, but I'll have to say it in English, and that is, one hand alone does not clap. In Chinese, the word crisis has two elements, danger and opportunity. This stereotype poses a danger that prejudicious portraits will continue to divide us from our fellow human beings, will continue to make our children ashamed of their heritage, will continue to infuriate us and frustrate us, will continue to bring about the destruction and death of others in the Middle East. But the stereotype also gives us an opportunity to join hands with others who have been dehumanized, to work with them, to recognize, to reevaluate all cardboard caricatures in order for us to see more clearly the human diversity. What is needed is a vision of truth, an image of the Arab as neither saint or devil, but as a fellow human being with all the potentials and frailties that condition applies. Like Dr. Alan Bozak said last night, the shaping of tomorrow is in our hands. The youth Arab-American youth, the future really is yours. It's up to you to light a torch and to use that torch not to ignite buildings, but to illuminate the hearts and minds of your fellow Americans, indeed the fellow peoples of this universe. In conclusion, do not underestimate the power of your actions. In 1975, I wrote an article on the Arab image. It wasn't published until 1978 nearly 100 rejection letters. Today, with God's help and the support of my family, I've written more than 200 essays just on this issue alone. The impact that you and your friends could have to build a sense of a community, a common ground, is very important. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world, said Margaret Mead. In fact, that's the only way it's ever happened. Know with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that the brotherhood of man, women, will eventually become a reality. Know with Socrates that one who injures another injures himself or herself spiritually. Know with Aristotle that hope is a waking dream. And know in the memory of Alex Oda that stereotypes are lies. And Alex wrote, lies are like dead ashes. When the wind of truth blows, the eyes are dis lies are dispersed like dust and disappear. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Shaheen. I think now you, you know what I was saying a few minutes ago. The second panelist is Mr. Martin Marvin Wingfield. Mr. Wingfield is a doctoral candidate in religion at the Catholic University of America. He was the ADC Director of Outreach from 1984 to 1991. This is why you see him relaxed now and during the convention. Those of you who know him before, I mean, he's, he's always the one running around, and uh, I, I, I don't know he, whether he sleeps or not. But he keeps us awake, because for seven years, 
He sends press releases, he sends questions, he sends us information so that we have to run around in each state and do something about it. He also worked with the Palestine Human Rights Campaign and received his Master M.A. in Biblical Studies from the Earlham School of Religion. Marvin. Thank you, Hamzi. Can you hear me? <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to compliment uh, Jack's uh, presentation with a look at some of the social and historical context within which uh, anti-Arab discrimination occurs and which are, uh, provides some of its roots. We recall the, the wave of anti-Arab bigotry, violence, uh, discrimination that occurred during the war, during Desert Storm, which now seems rather distant and far away. The, uh, we recall the, the headlines about Saddam, the national unity, the, uh, the heated patriotism, uh, the government's inflaming of hostility towards Iraq, and the way in which that fed into uh, acts of violence and attacks on the uh, Arab American community. We also remember the FBI questioning of Arab American community leaders, the surveillance of activists, and the over-emphatic welcome home to the troops. But now the war is remote and nobody seems to care much about what happened. Uh, and the burst of anti-Arab violence is over. ADC statistics showed that after the war, the uh, reported incidents dropped dramatically. But the roots of anti-Arab discrimination and racism are very much still alive. Those same people are still out there, the same attitudes are out there, and the same underlying social conditions are still there. In February of this year, uh, a report was issued by Klan Watch, which indicated that there has been, since the war, a major increase in the number of hate groups in the United States. That bigotry, violence, and discrimination against African Americans, Asians, Hispanics, Jews is rising. There's an increase in anti-Japanese feeling in Southern California. There are terrorist attacks on abortion clinics. The Ku Klux Klan is reorganizing again. The neo-Nazis, skinheads, and as we know, it's been business as usual at the LAPD. But, but it's not just hate organizations. Uh, racism and discrimination also comes with a conventional middle class moralism and respectability. Uh, we see that kind of racism in respectable people in attitudes of resentment, haughtiness, arrogance, and the assumption of their own superiority. We see it in people's attitudes of indignation and in the presumption of, of their own righteousness and virtue. Now, underneath that racism, I think there's a growing anger around the country, and there's a lot to be angry about. Uh, we, we're meeting here in the shadow of the uprising in L.A. and the uh, widespread outrage all across the country about the acquittal of the police officers in the Rodney King case. And people have been angry at the uh, state of the economy, the recession, the threat of unemployment, the SNL crisis, people angry at the Japanese for their economic success, angry over the gutting of government social programs over the past dozen years. You know the litany. Drugs, urban violence, crime, AIDS, homelessness, family instability, gay rights, abortion, feminism, you name it. People are angry about public sexual scandals and the media circus that goes with them. We see the anger expressed in the support for the Ross Perot candidacy and in the upset primary elections in Illinois and Pennsylvania where women candidates have come out of nowhere to pose serious challenges to incumbents. Now, I, I think this anger stems from a social crisis that policymakers have refused to acknowledge and can't respond to effectively. There's a cultural crisis and a crisis of legitimacy and effectiveness in the institutions of our society. And certainly the Rodney King case is being perceived as a, a failure, a, a crisis of legitimacy for the criminal justice system. But more broadly, 
there's a sense that the political and economic institutions simply are incapable of dealing with a lot of the problems that exist. Uh, and the policymakers and officials are being seen as a part of the problem. Witness the House banking scandal. The very framework of political thought seems out of touch with the realities it's trying to deal with. We can do almost anything with technology and organization, but we don't know how to deal with human beings and human problems. Uh, how to successfully meet the needs of inner city youth and provide meaningful and effective alternatives to the drug and criminal culture. It's not being done. It, it has to be done. And the institutions of the society are very often no longer seen as embodying and ex implementing the values of the people. There's, in fact, there's been a major restructuring of values in American society. There's a lot of polarization around questions of values. There's no longer a unified values system, no longer a consensus regarding the fundamental meaning and purpose in American life. Today, it's a multicultural society, and there's a struggle about how to respond to that. Uh, progressive and democratic forces seek to find creative ways to integrate more fully people of color, new immigrants, and their cultural traditions and achievements into the fabric of American life, the multicultural curriculum, for example. But on the other hand, people have insulated, isolated, protected themselves in their own enclaves and subcultures, and that's a dangerous situation. It's a expression of weakness and a failure to confront the realities and difficulties of the life in the larger society. I think that situation is a breeding ground for bigotry and racism, a social crisis, a crisis of legitimacy, a crisis of values, a growing public anger. And anger looks for a target. People need someone to blame for their problems, their unemployment, their loss of status and place in society, and anger makes people strike out. And in American history, it's been those seen as outsiders who have been the targets. It's been a recurring pattern. The economy fails. Various social groups feel a threat to their status or power. The latest immigrant group is blamed. Nativist hostility towards foreigners flares into violence, discrimination, and bigotry. And Arab Americans have been one of those targets. The events precipitating anti-Arab outbreaks have been crises in the Middle East where the U.S. has been involved, but the underlying factors which drive people to that point of, of violence are more fundamental to the society and to the culture. Now, in the 19th century, it was the Irish who were the targets. In the 1890s, the Catholics. World War I, the Germans. After the war and during the 1920s, they went after everybody. Uh, the 100 percent American patriotic hysteria of the war continued and was directed against political radicals, blacks, foreigners in general, Catholics again, Jews, and also Arabs. Uh, in the early 1920s, the Ku Klux Klan in, in Macon, Georgia, ordered all the Syrians to get out of town. In Oregon, there was a wave of Catholic, excuse me, anti-Catholic nativist sentiments. Uh, anti-Catholic speakers toured the state. Catholics were seen as papal agents disloyal and undermining democracy, anti-Catholic editorials in the paper, ex-nuns, quote-unquote, and ex-priests spoke condemning the church. There was a directory of, quote, 100 percent American businesses for people to patronize. The American flag was nailed to the Catholic church steeple in one town, and the speaker said the only way to cure a Catholic is to kill him. And what was happening was that the Ku Klux Klan and the Masonic Lodges had organized an, an anti-Catholic movement, possibly with the backing of some corporate executives concerned with uh, undermining labor uh, movement at the time. They elected a legislature, uh, uh, elected a governor. They passed a referendum to close Catholic parochial schools. And this was, was responded to by the Knights of Columbus, the Bishops' Conference, who organized uh, an anti-deformation, an anti-discrimination movement. And they did outreach work, coalition work with mainline Protestants. There were official position statements issued publicly by the Lutherans, the Presbyterians, Adventists. The ad hoc committees formed. Prominent people and notables were enlisted to take a public stand. Uh, the minority organization defended itself in its own press and mobilized its members 
formed their own civil rights association, uh, took out newspaper ads, had their own speakers bureau, enlisted prestigious members of the community to be on their board as a show of support, used the parishes to, re to register Catholic voters, pastors preached about the issue, and they persuaded other groups to take a, a very visible stand to make clear that it was not just a Catholic issue. Now, things haven't changed that much. You know, the, the things that they were doing then are the same things that ADC is doing today. The same problems that they confronted then are being confronted today. What was going on then was that old stock Protestant white Anglo-Saxon Americans were defending their social order, their jobs, status, cultural values, identity, and way of life. And what they saw at stake was their own social and cultural hegemony. And this was expressed in mass arrests and deportation of foreign radicals. Does that sound familiar? The Klan elected the governors and so forth. There were vigilante terrorism against blacks, Catholics, foreigners, also bootleggers, adulterers, and other violators of small town traditional morality. The, th the rise of fundamentalism occurred at this time, reasserting traditional doctrines, traditional moral values, traditional cultural dominant of small town rural values. The prohibition movement of the 20s was centered on this cultural milieu it was aimed against the influx of Catholic immigrants from Eastern and Southern Europe. Liquor became the symbol of the conflict between cultures. Immigrants were blamed, but the real problem was the transition to modernity. People in or rooted in small town, rural, conservative, provincial areas were reacting to the social and cultural changes associated with rapid urban growth and industrialization. They were reacting to increased education, cosmopolitanism, sophistication in the cities, science, evolution, loss of religious faith, the secularization of public discourse, changes in values and morals. Skirts were going up, with immorality in the movies and in the back seats of Ford automobiles, divorce and birth control, illegal liquor and organized crime, moral issues, social crisis, cultural conflict. The the litany is different in the specifics, but the pattern is the same as today, I think, and that's the point of the history. The old immigrants at the time were more or less terrorized into assimilating, becoming, quote, 100% Americans, and now they're part of the established society feeling threatened by the new changes that are coming along. In the past decades, the Cold War and the military-industrial complex has for decades usurped the resources, funds, expertise, and political will needed in order to effectively address domestic issues and social needs. Pro progressives have been preoccupied with foreign policy issues. Now with the end of the Cold War, the obsolescence of the military industrial complex and its refusal to die, the restructuring of world economic relationships, things are more unsettled, but there's hope for change. The pattern in the past is a pattern now. Political and economic changes create changes in values, generate conflicts people perceive in terms of moral issues. And the outsider, the representative of immorality, is the, is the foreigner, the alien, the embodiment of alien values, ideas, ways of life, and they are who gets targeted. The mentality behind it, though, is very much the same as in the past. America first. American superiority, American superiority to other cultures, isolationism, except for American military dominance. The cultural hegemony and dominance of older stock Americans who have an established place, centrally but no longer exclusively white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. It's a refusal to be in solidarity with people of other cultures. There's an ethical failure, a failure in common humanity. And this kind of thinking has attached to it this long heritage of racism and discrimination. But the, the paradox I would like to point to uh, here is that this anger is a moral anger. It's rooted in a collective moral order that's being undermined. It's a righteous indignation that oth often fuels the racial and ethnic antagonism. Racist language and action is perceived by the actor very often as the expression, excuse me, expression of legitimate outrage. And the racist and bigot perceives him or herself as a defender of moral principle. When the moral order is challenged, 
when a body of beliefs, values, aspirations, and ideals is threatened or in decline, the challenger is seen not as the bearer of a somewhat different and interesting set of cultural values, but as a threat to morality itself, as the symbol of unreason, of, un of groundless and willful, obstinate opposition to truth and morality. Then to strike out seems deserved in just retribution. It seems the reaffirmation of values, the reconstitution of moral order, of cultural identity, and of personal dignity. We should remember that recent attacks against Arab Americans here were part of what was felt to be a just war. And the patriotism of the war saw the nation as the embodiment of right values and justice. The war was seen as righteous. To attack Iraq was just. To slaughter soldiers and teach Saddam a lesson was moral. It was a redemptive act, in fact, freeing the U.S. from the Vietnam Syndrome, which placed limits on the exercise of U.S. power abroad. The war was seen as an exercise in moral authority to punish evil. Saddam was Hitler. But Saddam survived, and the U.S. did not go all the way there. It was actually a limited war with limited objectives. And the real goals and interests in the Gulf were linked to a policy seeking a balance of power in the Gulf so that the purposes and the outcome of the war were out of alignment with the psychology of the war. The American psychology of the war with its racist dimension was totalistic, seeking total victory and unconditional surrender. It was good versus evil. And there was no capacity for ambiguity, for rational goals or for rational limitations on the use of force. It was an all or nothing psychology. So to people with that mindset, the outcome was disappointing because there was no full military, moral, mythic victory. The symbol of evil was not removed. So I would argue that anti-Arab racism is, is more than government and media-induced war hysteria, more than displaced anger over threats to jobs and status. It goes deeper and is rooted in the fundamental values and the sense of cultural meaning and personal dignity that very many Americans have. Um, so just one word is in conclusion that to counter that, I think we must do more than condemn, but be ourselves the embodiments of, of values that can be perceived as such by our, our fellow citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Marvin. Uh, Mr. Majid Toma, please go to the registration desk. Our third panelist is Mrs. Audrey Shaheen, uh, Mrs. Or Audrey Shabbas. I'm sorry, Audrey. <laughs> 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 Yes, I mean, I, <laughs> so. uh, Audrey has received her BA in political science and international relations from the University of California at Berkeley, specializing in the Middle East and Near Eastern languages. She has taught courses on the Middle East and Sub-Saharan Africa in California schools and served as educational consultant on cross-cultural studies for the Greater Detroit Public Schools and enormous social service agencies. Shabazz has compiled many publications and study guides on the Arab world, including the Arab World Multimedia Units and the Arab World Notebook for the secondary school level. She has done extensive work with the United Nations and has spoken at various UN, UN panels and workshops on education and the Palestinian issue. In April 1992, she received the Janet Lee Stevens Award for the Arab American Understanding from the University of Pennsylvania. At present, she is the Executive Director of the Arab World and Islamic Resources and School Services. Again, Audrey is also one of my heroes because when she came to Colorado, she introduced me to the educational system there and she gave me 20 copies of her book, Arab World, for me to distribute to the secondary schools. And I ended up distributing those 20 sets 
and printing or copying 65 others mm. Mm. against the, the rights, or whoever has the right for that book. <laughs> so I hope she doesn't hold me responsible for that. Audrey. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That was nice. Uh, yesterday you told me that I was another person who gave you big headaches. and I. Yesterday you told me that I was another person who gave you big headaches, and I took that as a compliment as well. <laughs> I want to thank. Okay. I want to thank ADC. Is it on now? Okay. I want to thank ADC for inviting me here today. The organization that I direct, AWARE, is headquartered in Berkeley, California. I think we're the only national organization um, headquartered on the West Coast. And there is life outside of the Atlantic Sea Coast. And there is life west of the Rocky Mountains. I agree. And I think that, that we have a real grasp on what uh, America is thinking and feeling. And we come up with some awfully good ideas from our part of the United States. I'm grateful to ADC's commitment to the educational work. Obviously, from the introduction, you know that my work has been at the pre-college level, at what gets taught about the Arab world and Islam from kindergarten through the 12th grade. Um, our first work, way back in the 70s, called the Arab World a Handbook for Teachers, um, got some of its impetus from ADC. It was They helped us with the beginnings of revision work of that work. And eventually, we went on not to revise the Arab World, a handbook for teachers, but to publish the Arab World Notebook for the secondary school level. And you can have a look. I do, we do not have an exhibit booth here this year. Um, caring about what goes on in the schools at the pre-college level was, in the 1960s and the 1970s, exclusively women's work. Um, we finally decided, after trying to get the support of men in the community, that it was, after all, we women who understood best that attitudes are developed and shaped at a very early age. We knew this because we were all mothers. Um, in the ensuing years, thank heavens, uh, there have been lots of brothers out there who have, who have come to understand this and give us their support and their encouragement. What does go on at the pre-college level? And I'm not speaking just about just before they get into college, but from the very beginning. If you've been a student in the American school system, or if you've been a parent of a student in the American school system, you know. Uh, if you've been a student, you definitely know. If you've been a parent, you might know. Um, but on the other hand, if you have children like my own, they might not bring home those awful things that are in the textbooks because they don't want mom to storm down to the principal's office or to the school board. So sometimes parents don't know. Obviously, first of all, there's the textbooks. Um, and, and the primary source, of course, is social studies textbooks. It's what gets taught in history and economics and civics and anthropology and sociology, depending on how sophisticated your school system is. But it's not only social studies textbooks. There are also the math books. Yes, they can have awful things, and supplementary texts. To give you uh, an idea of, of things that are being said currently, um, this is the textbook that about what you've been reading about the big controversy in California. It's the Houghton Mifflin. There's a whole series, kindergarten to the eighth grade. This happens to be the seventh grade text, because this is the text that deals with the rise of Islam in the Middle Ages. Um, whereas every other world culture in this textbook begins with a page called A Moment in Time. It might be a Roman legionnaire, or it might be a samurai warrior. Would you like to know what Islam gets? Yeah. Not a human being at all. It's a camel. Okay. It's the only cultural region that is not represented by a human being. The kinds of things that, the racist things that go on are more subtle than they were before, but that doesn't make them better. Um, I have spoke to many school district school boards about the text and would say, yes, it's probably better than any textbook we've had before, but that's not good enough. We're a different people. We're in a different place. And a little bit of racism will not cut it anymore. Here's an example of a little bit of racism. 
This is in a chapter on the Crusades, and so it's almost hidden from view. And it's out in the margin. That means this is a note to the teachers. It says, ask the students, why did both the Christians and the Muslims consider Jerusalem a holy city? And then in parentheses and in italics, here's the answer provided for the teacher. Because Jerusalem is where Christ was buried, was crucified and buried, and where Muhammad supposedly rose to heaven. Okay. Now when you call this to teacher's attention, they first of all, they get the supposedly part. They get the inequality with which these two religions are treated. But what sometimes needs to be pointed out is something more subtler. Christ was not this man's name. Christ was whom Christians believe him to be. So it was setting that as, as a fact, a fait accompli. It should correctly say, because Jerusalem is where Jesus, where Christians believe Jesus was crucified and buried, and where Muslims believe Muhammad rose to heaven. A symmetry in its presentation. Math books are not outside the realm. There was, in a math workbook last year, a math problem. Students compute the answer as, as, a, as a riddle. And you do all the math questions, and then up comes the answer. And here, here's the riddle. How does the, oil, the illiterate, oil-rich sheik sign his name? And when you've computed the math problems, you, you find out he puts his X on. Get it? E-X-X-O-N. Supposed to be funny. My son's own assignment on Islam came with this kind of an essay problem. Write an essay about life in the desert from the point of view of the camel. And this was an essay question on Islam. One of the things I like to do when I deal with teachers, and this is, this is a forum um, that I have been out of for several years. If I do a teacher workshop of this many teachers, I'll have 10 co-presenters and we'll break you down into 10 small groups so that you can do things and say things and get involved with the material. But I have one here, and maybe this young man who's, would you just give these to people in the front row, that maybe the two of you? I only have 40 copies. This is a photocopy of something that appears in a US history textbook. And what I have teachers do with it is something called a critical thinking exercise. Now when teachers hear critical thinking, they know what that is. They know that it's the most important thing we can teach our students. And there's all kinds of things to do to learn to be a critical thinker. What I ask teachers to do with this little piece is to do a critical thinking exercise called reading for loaded language. Now, loaded language, teachers know, means subjective language. Language that tells you the author of this has an opinion, and you can find it right there. And most people think, oh, but history textbooks, that's, that's the truth. That's not anybody's opinion. Um, Hopefully, history teachers don't believe that. What, they, what I ask them to do here is to circle every instance where they see loaded language. And so those, for those of you who have a copy of it in front of you, I ask you to do that. Draw a circle around the words or the phrases or the parts of sentences that tell you this person is loaded. This person has got opinions, and they're right there in front. Now, when teachers do this, right away they assume that I've chosen some offbeat, obscure history book because obviously it's really terrible. Let me tell you, the rest of you, what people are circling. This is an introduction to the Middle East. Meanwhile, the Middle East festered with religious hatred and political chaos. Can you imagine an uglier image than something that's festering? Here comes another loaded language. The assassination of, in 1981 of peace-loving Anwar Sadat. Okay, there's somebody's opinion. By Muslim fundamentalists who kept the pot boiling. There's another little phrase there that's quite telling about this person's opinion. And Israel took steps to defend itself. There's some more loaded language. The third paragraph down talks about Lebanon. And here we see that Lebanon was a haven of peace and prosperity, which began to slide towards chaos after the PLO moved in. They, meaning the PLO, would set off the explosion that would blow the country into anarchy. And we could go on and on circling all these loaded languages. Teachers are appalled 
And when I tell them this came from the most highly respected U.S. history textbook in the country, they are stunned. This is Prentice Hall's A History of the United States. It's edited by Daniel Borstein, <laughs> our Librarian of Congress. I mean, the Librarian of Congress could hardly have better credentials. And this is widely used. Now, if I had showed teachers this first, they might have, have been defensive. But in doing it this way, they're never going to pick up any textbook again without being geared to reading for loaded language, at least minimally that one kind of exercise in critical thinking. Because this is a textbook they normally would have respected until they have done this exercise. Um, Houghton Mifflin's offering, and then there are supplementary texts, you know, all the little reading books and the things that are in the library. Houghton Mifflin just put out a catalog of supplementary texts, and the, I eagerly turned to the page that said the Middle East. There I th think were five storybooks on the Middle East. One was about a child in a Nazi concentration camp. Th does that fit the Middle East? Uh, three were about Israeli children on kibbutz or somehow trying to eke out a life being surrounded by hostile, mean Arabs. Um, one, one was about a young American girl who falls in love with an Iranian on the eve of the uh, Khomeini revolution. And another was about some children being taken hostage. And that's it. That was the, the reading offerings at the reading level of, say, a fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grader. What gets taught and when at the school level? We need to know this if we are going to impact what gets taught. In the primary grades, children learn about people in other lands. They learn about people other than themselves. They learn to think about the world outside themselves and their own family. And this is really where attitudes get formed, where they decide to value themselves and to value other peoples, or not to value themselves, not to value other peoples. It's where they learn how to, who in this world are the good guys and who are the bad guys, or hopefully they're going to learn to think in terms of the world as one human family. In the sixth and seventh grade is where they learn about the ancient civilizations, the uh, rise of religions, including the growth of Islam. And at the high school level, they may reprise that. That is, they may review that ancient uh, up through the, the seventh and eighth centuries, but largely in high school, they concentrate on the modern period. In California, they have done this exclusively, and soon other states will follow California's model, and I will tell you why in a few minutes. In the sixth grade is where they study the ancient civilizations, the origins of Judaism and Christianity, and not until the seventh grade do they study Islam, and that was done, that was a political decision that was made to keep Islam separate and separated by a whole year of study from Judaism and Christianity. Uh, in the seventh grade, they study only the thousand-year period of the Middle Ages, and in the high school, they study the modern period. We attempted to impact some of that California framework, and we did in some ways, but our major impact has been in re not in reacting to what the textbooks say and what goes on, but in proacting, that is, in other words, in taking a proactive stance in creating materials. Um, the Arab World Notebook for the secondary school level was our first creation. Last spring, the Arabs' activities for the elementary school level was published right in the midst, or created right in the midst of the Gulf War. Um, I was grateful to have work to do so that I was not watching television um, and seeing that war. In January of 1991, our phones were ringing off the hooks from elementary teachers. Always secondary teachers are calling to say, I need to know, I need to know about Kuwait, I need to know about Iraq, I need to know what this war is going to be about, I need to understand the Middle East. But it was very curious that right there on the eve of the war, all the phone calls were from elementary teachers. That was very new. And even from preschool teachers. And what they were saying to us was, please, what have you got that will help us put a human face on these people? And the other one routinely that we heard was, I'm aghast at the attitudes I'm seeing in very young children. You know, first graders coming in and saying, we're going to kick butt. Preschoolers who come in, four-year-old boys wearing camouflage, 
four-year-old girls with yellow ribbons pinned on their dresses. And believe me, no one in this country is involved more in peace education work than our elementary teachers. They may not call it that. They may call it conflict resolution. They may not call it anything. But you know, children hitting each other, biting each other, solving their problems in violent ways just doesn't go in, in elementary school anymore. They have all kinds of wonderful techniques. Time out, peace round tables. Susie, Johnny doesn't know why you're angry at him. Let's see if we can use words. And so it was elementary teachers who began to see their whole world coming apart as we went into that war. And by April, we had published the Arabs' activities for the elementary school level. By June, it was adopted in several school districts. And uh, at least in one school district that I know of, Oakland, which is a very large school district, um, that curriculum is being used as a model for the development of all their multicultural materials. So if you are a group of Chinese Americans and you're creating multicultural materials, or you're a group of Native Americans and you're developing some curriculum materials, you're given our, the Arabs, as a guide. Do it this way. Do it just like they have done. Um, so the pedagogic design, that is the educational design, is one that has, has really caught hold. And our newest one that we did this year, um, that ought to be a wonderful activity we could involve ourselves in at next the ADC convention. It is being done by adults, so we designed it for seventh graders in California. Remember, this is where they study Islam in the Middle Ages, just that thousand year period. The people who designed, made those political decisions to design it that way, to keep Islam separate, what they didn't see, but what we saw, was that we were being given a wonderful opportunity. What civilization dominates that thousand year period of the Middle Ages? It's the Arab Islamic civilization. So for teachers who normally spent three days teaching about that period, now are spending six, eight, 10, 12 weeks studying that period. And for that thousand year period of, of roughly 600 AD to 1700 AD, um, this is the exciting, wonderful thing. Last year we had teachers saying, help me, my God, I don't know what to do. Last, last year I spent three days, this year I'm spending six weeks. What, what do I do with it? How, where is the materials I need? Um, this year we still have teachers saying that, but the other teachers who did it for the year are coming back and saying, I did it. It was wonderful. What a fantastic civilization. Why did we always spend so much time on the Roman Empire anyway? <laughs> and and what have you got for us this year? So the idea of the banquet, the medieval banquet in the Alhambra Palace, is that students culminate that unit of study by putting on a banquet. And it wouldn't have been quite the same if they had done a banquet in a castle in Germany or a banquet in a castle in England. This could only happen in Spain. First of all, the Alhambra is not like a European castle. It's like a fairy tale palace. They have to know about the art and architecture. How do we make this room look like the Alhambra Palace? What will be the music we'll be listening to? What stories will be told? And in what manner might they be told? What games will we play? How will we entertain ourselves during this banquet? Of course, what will we be wearing? And what will we be eating? And we're very careful in our workshops and in our curriculum never to talk about what we're going to be wearing as costume. Okay? You know, that people in other periods in history and people in other countries wear costumes, but we wear clothes. So we always refer to it as clothing. What will we be wearing? And of course, eating. But perhaps most importantly, and I think this is the real radical part of the work, and in many ways I consider it the most radical work I've done, is who will be there? When you have students role-playing historic persons from across three continents, now the Americas were not connected to what was going on, but Arab Islamic civilization was well connected, Europe and Africa and Asia, you can have Mansa Musa come from Mali and Queen Amina come from Zaria, and Queen Zubaydah come from Baghdad, and Arwa come from Yemen. I'm, if I'm mentioning women, it's also because of our attempt to rewrite women back into history. I think we have an equal number of women guests. <laughs> As men guests, we have two Muslims from the Indian subcontinent, Amr Kushro and Razia Sultana, and even somebody that seventh graders know about, a Japanese woman called Lady Murasaki, who wrote the Tales of the Genji, fits the time period. She comes to the banquet. 
They would never in their wildest imaginations get the idea that this civilization connected all of these people and made this possible, uh, given the way history textbooks are set up. Um, Europeans, of course, uh, Leonardo da Vinci's there, Eleanor of Aquitaine. Um, Eleanor of Aquitaine got all those ideas of courtly love and the ideas that women should not be treated as property but should be treated with respect and, and courted and so forth. She got those from the troubadours of Spain. Um, she knew about that well, so she comes to the banquet, that's natural. St. Thomas Aquinas is there, and in fact you could expect a three-way conversation between Ibn Rushd, who talks about the contributions he made to synthesize rational thought and theology. You know, what, what made uh, the civilization so great was that in Islam there was no contradiction between whatever the mind could conceive of in terms of intellectual activity, artistic, scientific. That was never a, a problem with Islam, the religion, with theology. And that's what allowed this great flowering of intellectual activity to take place. So Ibn Rush introduces himself, and who's over in the corner saying, my God, I've been dying to meet you. I'm Thomas Aquinas. <laughs> it wasn't until I, till you were the one that gave me the, re, the arguments to put forward that allowed Europe's renaissance to take place. And at this point, a third person will, will uh, chime in and want to be part of the three-way conversation, and he turns out to be Moses Maimonides, who said, I, I've been having the same conversation within Judaism. I'm so glad to meet the two of you. Uh, let's find a quiet corner where we can talk. This does happen. It happens when teachers do it. It happens when seventh graders do it. And it's a marvelous experience, one they'll remember all their lives. If you remember what in your school days left a lasting impact, it was something you did. It was sports. It was a play. You produced a school yearbook. Um, but it was something that you actively did, not passively. We're very excited about it, and so are the teachers. We no longer have to... Uh, approach a school district. We no longer have to set up a teacher's workshop and then try to entice teachers to come. They're asking us to come out and do this for them. Um, and, and we're kept very busy. We're doing it three times a month uh, right now with a busy schedule. Why in California? What's so important about at least starting this work in California? We have national aspirations and, and, you're, and you play a role in all of that just as we do. Uh, one out of three students in the United States is in California. It's true. One out of three students in the, Don Bustani, who lives in California, doesn't believe it. Uh, it's, a, it's true. We're a very young state. And we're a very populous state. So that makes it, if one out of three in the United States is in California, it's certainly we can understand quickly why California is the biggest market for textbooks. We're talking about billions of dollars in textbooks. And it's why the educational decisions and the political games that get played with education get played out in California. Then the textbooks are written to reflect that political games that have been played. And sooner or later, all the rest of the country has to buy into it because those are the textbooks. Those textbooks have been created for California, and the rest of you are stuck with it. Texas is the number two state when it comes to the importance of educational decisions that get made. Um, why have we concentrated and why should all of us concentrate our efforts in social studies? Um, it's because it's where the obvious, it's where the history takes place. Yes, there are those awful things that we might find in a math book or in a language arts book, but it's, it's social studies. And here I'd like to put up the first transparency that I brought to show you. Um, it looks at how social studies or teachers are organized and impacted um, I also have some handouts about this if you can't see it. But there's a major national organization of social studies teachers, 30,000, and they're headquartered here in Washington. You don't have to be a teacher to join the National Council for the Social Studies. Then you have state councils for the social studies. You ought to become a member of your state council. And then there are regional councils. Your own county might have a council or a group of counties. We've got the San Francisco Bay Area Council for the Social Studies. There are other organizations of social studies teachers as well and other kinds of teachers, but it's the National Council of Social Studies that is the most important. Uh, do you want to put up the second transparency? This is how we impacted the California framework. Um, we didn't did not impact in, in any very significant way what the seventh grade framework did. Um, 
in setting aside this thousand year period. But in the 10th grade level, there's a horrible uh, thing that they're supposed to study. They're supposed to study about the modern Middle East. And you're going to know everything you need to know about the modern Middle East if you study two guys. One good guy, you know, cannot know who that is, right? You study about Israel. And one bad guy, you study about Syria. And that's the way the framework is set up. And it tells you, you're going to learn these things when you study about Israel, and it's a catalog of wonderful things. And you're going to learn these things when you study about Syria, and it's a catalog of negatives. It was written with a Cold War mentality in mind that divided the world between our friends and our enemies. And we tried to tell the framers that that didn't work. It wasn't helpful to students. It wouldn't help them understand the Middle East in the year 1990, and it certainly wouldn't help them understand the world in the year 2000. Well, it doesn't help them understand the Middle East now because Syria is now on the, the list of the good guys. So what we did was we created an alternative framework. We said this is how 10th graders ought, this is what they ought to study about the Middle East. And the journal that goes out to every California social studies teacher published it. The editor liked it. He liked our work. And he offered it as an alternative. It's the one that says nationalism in the Middle East. And uh, when I go throughout the state, I find teachers saying, yeah, I th uh, the California framework I threw in the drawer. I use your, I, you use your uh, idea of what, how the modern Middle East ought to be approached. So when we didn't succeed from the top, we started from the bottom, from the level of the teachers. And believe me, you're going to have a great deal of success if you start there, not trying to impact the school board or even the superintendent, but go directly to the teachers and directly to the librarians. Um, this year we have done 26 teacher workshops. That's around the country, not in California. In fact, most of them out of California. And we've gone to nine conferences of teachers. Um, if you put up transparency number three, I may be, we may be coming to your area and we need your help. These are the top are the places that are, we're going to exhibit to in the near future. And the teacher workshops are workshops we're going to be putting on within the next three months. And so I think you can see a lot of places that I don't even know my way around. Massachusetts, Texas Tech, I think that's in a place called Lubbock. Brigham Young University, Oregon, North Carolina, uh, Tennessee, Louisville. And, and it's really important that the local communities become involved in these. Um, you can come out. I'll, We'll, I'll put you to work. You can, you can have a, a, a group of teachers you can make a presentation to. Um, it's really a, a group effort. In these conferences that we've attended in the last uh, year, we have put directly into the hands of teachers 10,000 copies of our catalogs. And the catalog is really a response to teachers um, who we would talk to and say, you know, there's this wonderful book for, that you could read to fourth graders, and here's this great thing on Islamic art that, that just fits what you're doing in the eighth grade. And we would give them lists of how they could obtain all these books. But about a year ago, teachers began saying to us, it would be a lot easier if we could get them all from you. So we put all of these resources, not just the ones we've developed, but the other good materials that are out there, identified where they fit, this is great for the seventh grade. This is marvelous for the 10th grade when you're studying such and such. And we've put 10,000 of these catalogs directly into the hands of teachers. We've had no money to do any kind of mailing. Not a single one has been mailed unless a teacher writes to us and says, can I have a copy? Uh, but we go one-on-one -on -one with teachers at these exhibits and hand them to them. And in this, um, we can all play a very major role because we're ready to ship out to your ADC chapter in Tucson, Arizona, or in Detroit, Michigan, uh, a quantity of these catalogs. When you go out to talk to school officials, and I, I've been an Arab parent too who's gone and, and, and complained to a principal about what a book says, and their first question they shoot back at us is, well, have you, what, what's good? Have you got anything out there that's good? And for a long time, we weren't able to answer. Um, or if we answered, it was difficult. We weren't sure if the thing was in print. We weren't sure if it was available in the United States. Well, these are all marvelous materials that they can get their hands on immediately. I decided, I guess you've, you've guessed, I decided that when I came here today, um, I wasn't going to lament all of the terrible anti-racist stuff that's out there in textbooks and schools, but rather to emphasize the positive. And it's not just an emphasis on the positive. There really has been a wonderful 
12 months, two year period for us where we have found teachers and schools and librarians absolutely open to anything we can put in their hands and recommend to them. Um, and there have been not one single obstacle in our path. My, my bookkeeper would want me to say except for funding. <laughs> but none of the obstacles that, that, we, that we normally think of as people trying to discredit you or to discredit uh, what you have to say. None at all. Um, and ask to, to, to let you know how open the field is right now to change. Uh, National Geographic, uh, besides publishing National Geographic magazine, which last November did a whole special issue on Ibn Battuta, they also publish something that's just for teachers, and they send it out to every teacher in the country. That's transparency number four, I think. It's called Update. And in this issue, the winter issue, you can, you can just flip to five and six now. They followed up that special edition with, on Ibn Battuta by giving lesson plans about him for the classroom. And then finally, at the end, by listing where other resources teachers should turn to. And they got it right. They didn't tell him to go to the ADL to look for resources on Ibn Battuta. Uh, they didn't send them to these awful publishers who publish all this crap. They sent them to AWARE. They I had them look at the materials that we recommend. I about fell off my chair when the call came from National Geographic and said that they wanted to do this. Um, we're really becoming, what do I want to say, mainstream. In fact, there's an organization of teachers called Radical Teachers um, that I just recently joined and don't know why I hadn't known about it before and they publish a very slick impressive magazine called Radical Teacher and someone said you ought to write to them they're going to do a whole special issue on the Middle East so I Xeroxed all kinds of stuff from the Arab World Notebook on the Palestinians and and uh, poetry by uh, Mahmoud Darwish and all kinds of of stuff for them and said what use whatever you like tell me what you how you want it to be writ rewritten what can I do for you and we got back a letter, I'm, I'm almost embarrassed to say. Um, I didn't know if it was a compliment or not. They said, we can't use your materials. After all, we're the radical teacher. And they underlined it four times and said, your stuff is too mainstream. <laughs> and, and I sort of was smiling and downcast and said, well, I guess that's what we wanted. And I think a lot of it has to do with the look of the material, how it's presented. And, that, and that's what we strove for. Uh, but believe me, its content is not. What are the work ahead that we need to do? Uh, we have a real opening and an opportunity within the National Council for the Social Studies, and that's the last, I think, the last or the next to the last transparency. We've been playing our cards there long enough that we have uh, just gotten ourselves elected chairman of a group called International Human Rights Educators. That's a group within the National Council that used to be headed by the ADL. Um, we've gotten a presidential appointee to the Equity and Social Justice Committee. Uh, the first time anyone has been on that committee that's been representing the concerns of Arabs or the concerns of Muslims. Um, and we just recently got a presidential appointee to a national task force of eight people selected from across the country that will be writing new multi-ethnic guidelines for the United States of America. There's a lot of work to be done in all of our state councils. And, and we all need to be involved in this together. In your schools, as I said, you can now happily go back and say there are good materials. Here are them. A lot of them you'll see in the hallways here. Um, we order materials from, from Interleak, from AME New in New York, from the Washington Report. Um, and then get them out and put them in the hands of teachers. Uh, your school districts ought to be having workshops on the Arab world and Islam. And they shouldn't be workshops that you have to pay for and that you have to organize and that you have to publicize. They ought to be coming to you and asking you to do it. Uh, not to ask you to do it, but they ought to be saying yes and agreeing with you and then bringing us out to work with you to put on those workshops. Um, I have a couple of handouts that I can give out to people um, when we're finished about how to get involved in the state, at the state level, how decisions are made at that state level, what's the process. Um, if you come in at the point of view where people are trying to decide what textbooks to adopt, 
it's almost too late. It's three years before that where they're deciding what the textbooks ought to say that one needs to be involved. And that, that cycle comes around about every six or seven years. Um, we want to reach out this year and to expand ourselves out of the public school social studies teachers into the NEA, which is the National Education Association, which covers all the disciplines, every teacher at every level. Um, and I think there's a big opportunity for us to impact what goes on in Catholic schools. And the National Catholic Educators Conference is one where we ought to have a visibility. And I think I'm going to close right there. I've said too much. <laughs> Thank you, Audrey. I mean, you got more time, but I think you gave us more than you took. Uh, I have two announcements. One announcement is that at 6 o'clock, the university ADC chapters will have a brief meeting in Salon C. So please attend. The second announcement is about voting registration. As you know, in America, you have the right to vote. But if you don't, vo if you don't register to vote, you don't exist. Simply, you are not there. So those who live in the area, please register. There's, there's a registration table uh, across from the stalls. And it will be, oh, will be closed at 7 o'clock. So please go and register there. Uh, I want to add one thing about what Audrey said. How many of you are aware of ADL uh, program of a world of difference. Well, this program is a very vicious program. It is adopted by ADL B'nai B'rith, and it is a program that they give to teachers, and they give them credit for it. In that program, there is no mention about Arab Americans unless you fight for it and you include something about Arab Americans. About Islam, there is one, one mention of Islam is uh, when uh, Islams are kill, killing Hindus in India. That is the only mention about Islam. And this is something that we have to fight. Uh, what we did after Audrey's visit to Colorado is that we took the, her book, Arab World, if you want to show. Yeah. Yeah. This book is similar uh, in preparation to the one ADL has for teachers. And it trains teachers how to teach about uh, the Arab world. And this is more generous, uh, general, and it has no uh, specific discrimination against anybody. And in this book, there are references for films, for uh, documents, for any information that the teacher needs to have. And this is the book that I made 65 copies and distributed. Because it is worth it. It is worth the investment. Because if you give it to a teacher, you are sure that that teacher is going to use it. And check with her students, if you have Arab American students in her classes, you will find that teachers are using it. If you put it in the library only, nobody will use it. So although we, the first 20 books, we put them in the library, in each school district, and we didn't get any output, any input that, that the teachers have used it. But when we start to hand them out to, to teachers, then it has been used, and sometimes they come with questions or whatever it is. I wish everybody check with his school district and have a look at the contents of this book, because it's, valuable, it's very valuable. Now, now we go to questions. Yeah, uh, Rain Akeley from Youngstown, Ohio. I want to thank uh, Audrey Shabbos. Uh, and, and let me second everything uh, you, you just said, Mr. Uh, Mokharabi. We've used in Youngstown the Arab World Notebook in many different contexts. And I want to thank you and everybody involved with it. It's a beautiful resource. And some colleagues of mine at the university have been ordering it and getting it out and uh, endorse everything you said. Uh, along with that, Audrey, I'd like respectfully 
to just maybe offer a few criticisms of some of the things that uh, that you brought up, particularly the, and it's a small point, I, I agree with you overall, these textbooks obviously are very racist, and maybe I'm, I'm splitting hairs here, but the, the uh, reference to Jerusalem, uh, where Jesus died and was buried and supposedly, or it should have been Jesus, excuse me, where they said Christ, and I agree with you on that. Had they said Jesus, uh, I think it would have been all right in that if you're talking about assumed into heaven, that is something that, that's an article of faith. And to say Muhammad was assumed into heaven would be like saying Jesus rose from the dead. That what they did say was Jesus died and was buried. We know people die. We know people are buried. So I think if considered in that context, then the use of the word supposedly may just have been the attempt uh, not, not to be endorsing the, the, the Islamic faith as, as if they would have been endorsing the Christian faith had they said resurrected. So uh, you can consider We know people are buried. So I think if considered in that context, then the use of the word supposedly may just have been the attempt uh, not, not to be endorsing the, the, the Islamic faith as, as if they would have been endorsing the Christian faith had they said resurrected. So uh, you can consider that. And one, one other criticism, uh, your description of the situation in, in, in Lebanon. I agree, very simple uh, and very incomplete. Yet nonetheless, I think your description of the PLO, PLO role uh, uh, was, was accurate to, to some degree. And many people would agree that it was accurate, albeit incomplete. And, and much more complicated than that. So I, I feel that sometimes maybe we uh, need to be a little more open even, even among ourselves. But overall, thank you so much for a fantastic resource. Thank you. Uh, I'd like, like to say that, that I always want teachers to opt for one standard. We're always talking about double standards. Um, and when it comes to describing people's religious faith, I think it's always important to say people of this faith believe such and such. People of that faith believe such and such. And to use that as, as the one standard. Um, again, we're talking about reading for loaded language and what kind of language is appropriate in an editorial page. In an editorial page, you may say, uh, and where people can debate with you, the PLO uh, blew Lebanon into anarchy. But to put it in the page of a history book where students believe that what's written between those pages for a student, if it's got a hard cover on it and it's in print, you know, that's almost as if it's revealed word. Um, that's an inappropriate place for opinion. Um, and another part of critical thinking is having students to, to distinguish between fact and opinion. And then they can take that even further and distinguish between some opinions are better than other opinions depending on whether one opinion is based on uh, prejudice or misinformation, another opinion might be based on uh, evidence. So all of these are taken up within all of these skills that are taught to students as critical thinking skills. Um, my question is addressed to anyone. One of, one of the problems that I personally see as far as um, anti-Arab or more specifically anti-Islamic discrimination is sort of the creation of an Islamic non-entity. Um, while I commend the efforts of other religious organizations for promoting their holidays, for example, um, you know, you, you see on TV, you know, NBC wishes to wish, uh, you know, everyone a happy, Merry Christmas or a Happy Hanukkah. You never see anything for Eid al-Fitr or, or anything like that. And you never see any awareness of the holidays, at least the Islamic holidays, in public schools. At least that was my experience when I was a student. Um, in elementary and high school. And what I'd like to ask is for anyone, most spe specifically to Ms. Shabazz, um, is there any, you know, how would you go into efforts as far as increase, increasing awareness and appreciation of Islamic holidays? Um, just so that, you know, we can, you know, we, set, we have our, you know, we don't celebrate Christmas, we celebrate Eid for two reasons. One, that explains to the non-Islamic community about our holidays. And two, it shows Islamic children that, you know, we don't need a Christmas. And, you know, how could we go about doing that? Well, one of the, thank you for the question. One of the things that we created for the Arab World Notebook was a section on holidays that, first of all, describes what the uh, Muslim holidays are and gives a five-year calendar for when they will be observed. 
And uh, this really uh, was a brainchild of something that I would get in my teacher's box every September when I, on that first day of school when I went back to see, you know, how many kids I was going to have in each period. There would be something from the local synagogue or the local ADL telling me what were the Jewish holidays and when they're going to fall during this school year and present it in a way so that I could put it under the glass of my desk or tack it on the wall. And the idea was that I was supposed to be aware of these dates. Um, I would like very much for every teacher in the country to, to come to school in September and find something like that um, on Islam. And we have it set up as a boilerplate, um, and it's ready to go to press as a brochure. And what it really needs on the back of it is not the address of some people way out in Berkeley, California, but it needs to, look, to know where is the local masjid, where is the local Islamic center, so those teachers know that there are people right there in their own community who can be resources for them. Unfortunately, what happens in this society is that people want to know based on where they're coming from. We will get a hundred phone calls from teachers that want to know what Islamic holiday falls in December. Um, and if it doesn't fit that time frame, then they really, don't really want to think about holidays. You know? so, so when the Eid uh, comes in December, we'll have a lot of, uh, a lot of people who will be interested. And, and in, the, in the meantime, we just have to sensitize them not to think of Islam or to think of anybody, other, anybody else's religion from the vantage point of their own. You know, if it can come close to Christmas or close to Hanukkah, uh, then they want to do it. And they think about it then. They want to be sensitive to other religious faiths, but they're not going to think about it in March or in May or in October unless, unless we really reach out and let them know about it. Okay, next. I'd like to address Dr. Shaheen, just ask his opinion about an experience that I had. Um, I'm a medical student and I just recently finished my second trimester and when I was taking, I was taking a genetics exam in which there was a question that related to DNA fin fingerprinting and how specific someone's DNA fingerprint was, but the scenario that was set up was a Lebanese American who was accused of rape um, and the identifying characteristics that the victim used to to point out this, to pick out this man were that he was dark skinned, had a mustache, and reminded her of Saddam Hussein. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I spoke, I confronted my professor saying that this was inflammatory, that it was racist, would he have dared to ask a similar question using any other ethnic minority in this country. He said, of course, that was not his intention, that in fact he was trying to um, dispel excuse me, dispel these, these myths and point out how easy it would be for, in this climate for someone to be railroaded. I just wonder what your opinion would be. How, how far should I go in terms of getting this on a record with the administration? Well, I think, uh, first of all, congratulations on taking the move and by interacting and just continue. Persistence and perseverance until it is removed. Unless, of course, he wants to uh, replace it with another ethnic group, which would, of course, do as much, if not more, damage. Now continue to pursue it, and if you need help, uh, there are those of us here and also in Washington that would certainly lend an arm of support. By all means. <laughs> I would say that the Bible has a, a, a prejudice against non-Abrahamic -Ara uh, Semitics and would like to say that it's certainly all right to raise questions about translations and liturgies, to clear these uh, uh, stereotype images out of the public mind. I suggest that the women have uh, successfully uh, challenged these, uh, the scriptures on the, the, the pro-male stereo uh, uh, prejudice or the anti-feminine prejudices of the scriptures uh, with some success and would assure us that this is a uh, an okay thing to do. Thank you. Yes, guy. My name is Muhammad Jalag from Columbus, Ohio. I just want to make a little comment that complaints sometimes it work out good. Uh, for example, about three months ago, uh, they show the film of uh, the Delta Force in uh, Columbus, Ohio. We raised hell about the other parts we don't like in it. So the TV station contact our uh, president of the Arab American of Central Ohio. They interviewed with him for about a few minutes. 
they show him the film again and they ask him which part of the film we don't like and they promise they will delete this part. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to direct my question to Mr. Wingfield. My name is Hany Khalil. I'm from Houston, Texas. I think you're absolutely correct to discuss and to point out the very long history and deep roots of nativism and racism within a Protestant American culture, within white culture in the United States. Uh, as did, and Roger Wilkins did this as well yesterday and pointed out as well that, that racism uh, strengthens and becomes more dominant in periods of economic crisis in the United States, typically. We're entering that sort of period and I was a bit troubled by your suggestion that what Arab Americans need to do at this point, given the situation, given that racism is a white problem first and foremost, I was troubled by your suggestion that Arab Americans somehow mute our culture or figure out how we can, we can uh, adopt values that will be pleasing to the dominant white culture. And I, I may be misinterpreting, to you, misinterpreting you, but I'd like you to, if possible, to expand upon that and give us a suggestion of where we can, where we can be ourselves and at the same time uh, recognize that racism is a pr pr primarily a white problem. How can we do that? Uh, I think it is being done. I, th I think that the Arab American community is the um, does live uh, out of very profound sense of, uh, of, of, of values that are that are in fact a kind of values that American society needs. The kind of sense of strong family ties and commitment to uh, ethical principle that I found in my experience with the Arab American community is very impressive. And so I, it, my comments were not at all intended to be suggesting that there's any, should be any muting of Arab identity or that you need to fish up values where they aren't, but, uh, but simply to pose uh, the living out of, of positive values as a step beyond uh, only criticizing uh, the negative. Would anyone else, anyone else like to respond to that? Sure. Okay. Well, thank you very much. As we leave here tonight, and as you leave the convention going home, please think it over and promise yourself that second and third place is not a place for Arab Americans. We want to be first. Thank you. Send your questions or comments about this forum to the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee, 4201 Connecticut Avenue Northwest, Suite 500, Washington, D.C., 20008. Coming next, a discussion on gay and lesbian civil rights. For more than a decade, C-SPAN has brought you live gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of the United States House of Representatives. In June of 1986, C-SPAN 2 was created to 